All right, here's my second try at question 56. I posted solutions to this a couple days ago and had a mistake in there. Got the right answer, but used the wrong logic. So thanks to anyone in the comments who pointed that out to me. Anyways, what's going on in this problem is we have a ring. So that there's no ambiguity, they specify a ring with identity. The identity they're referring to here is a multiplicative identity. And I was under the impression that all rings had a multiplicative identity, but apparently there's some disagreement there. Sometimes it's worth studying a structure that is not assumed to have a multiplicative identity, but otherwise satisfies the ring axioms. Sometimes that's called an RNG, like a ring without the I. Anyways, that was all news to me and not really relevant to this problem. In this problem, we have a ring such that for any element in the ring, the product of that element and itself is just that element. This criteria right here means that all elements are idempotent, which means that your ring is Boolean. So what we need to know is if we have a Boolean ring, which of the following statements must be true. So before we get into the specific statements, maybe it makes sense to review the ring axioms. So all a ring is is a collection of elements with two binary operations. One of them kind of acts like addition, one of them kind of acts like multiplication. So often you use those as your operations. This collection of elements and these two binary operations have to satisfy three criteria. The first is that the collection of elements is an abelian group under the operation that kind of acts like addition. The fact that these elements form a group under addition tells you that this operation that acts like addition is associative because it's abelian. This operation is commutative. There exists an identity element under this operation addition Maybe we'll call it zero, such that when we combine any element in our group with zero, we just get that element. And finally, for all elements in our group, there exists an additive inverse. Maybe I'll call it negative x, so that when we add together x and negative x, we get zero, this identity element. So the ring kind of inherits all this group stuff, but there's more to being a ring because we have this second operation that kind of acts like multiplication. Our collection of elements must be what's called a monoid, under our other operation, which I'll denote as multiplication. What that means is this operation multiplication is associative and there exists a multiplicative identity. Maybe I'll call it one so that when we combine any element in the group with one, we just get that element. So we kind of cover our first operation with this first axiom. We cover our second operation with this second axiom. And then our third axiom kind of combines the two operations. And it says that this second operation is distributive over this first operation. Maybe I can say multiplication is distributive over addition. So A times B plus C is AB plus AC, and A plus B times C is AC plus BC. All right, with that information, I think we can answer all these different questions. For the first one, the question is whether when we take any element in the ring and combine it with itself under this operation that acts like addition, are we guaranteed to get zero? Well, it turns out yes, and there's a fancy little proof of that. There's probably lots of different proofs, but the one that I saw starts out with this thing a plus a that we want to prove is equal to zero. We don't know a whole lot about this element a plus a, just that it's in the ring. Maybe I should have written that as a fourth group axiom that we have closure. And I suppose I could have included that over here when we talk about a monoid, sure. Anyways, because A is in the ring, A plus A is in the ring, and because the ring is Boolean, when I take any element in the ring and square it, I get that element in the ring. So this thing right here must be equal to this element squared. What is this element squared? Well, it's tempting to just call it 4A squared, and it is 4A squared, or A squared plus A squared plus A squared plus A squared. But it's not a horrible idea to get into the habit of writing these things really carefully, making sure that each of your steps are legitimate according to one of these axioms. So when we're squaring an element, really what we're doing is we're multiplying it by itself. Using this third property here that multiplication is distributive over addition, letting this A plus A represent this A, and this A plus A represent the B plus C, I get that this thing is equal to this A plus A times this A plus this A plus A times this A. Now I can apply this second form of distributivity. I think that's a word, maybe to get that a plus a times this a is a squared plus a squared. Similarly over here, I got a squared plus a squared. My goal is to show that this whole thing is zero, which might not be immediately obvious, but we can apply the fact that these elements are idempotent again to change all the a squareds into a's. And now if I add the additive inverse of a to both sides of the equation, maybe I get a plus a plus negative a equals a plus a plus a plus a plus negative a but this is just zero, so I get a plus zero, in other words, a. Similarly, this is just zero, so I get a plus a plus a plus zero. Do that one more time. Yeah, I could have done that all in one step. We're left with zero on this side and a plus a on this side. Exactly what we were hoping to show. Statement one is true.
It turns out that there's an argument that is very similar to that argument we just did to prove statement three. So maybe I'll jump ahead and do that next. What we're gonna do now, instead of starting with A plus A, we'll start with A plus B, where A plus B are just two elements in our ring. Because they're in our ring and we have closure, A plus B is in our ring. Because A plus B is in our ring and all elements in the ring are idempotent, A plus B squared must be equal to A plus B. So we can start out here. Just like we did over here, we can expand A plus B squared. Think about it as A plus B times A plus B. Apply your distributive property twice. You got A plus B times A plus A plus B times B. So you got A squared plus BA plus AB plus B squared. You can probably guess where to go from here because every element in the ring is idempotent. A squared is just equal to A and B squared is just equal to B. So I got A plus B is equal to A plus BA plus AB plus B. Add negative A to both sides on the left. Add negative B to both sides on the right. We get zero is equal to BA plus AB. Uh oh, that doesn't look quite right, right? Doesn't this tell me that BA and AB are negatives of each other? I wanna show that they're equal to each other. Well, what we can do is take advantage of something that we've already proven, right? If we add AB to both sides of this equation on the right, I get AB is equal to BA plus AB plus AB. But over on the right, I'm adding some element to itself. And a second ago, I proved that anytime I add an element of the ring to itself, I get zero. So AB plus AB is just equal to zero. AB is equal to BA. These are kind of famous little proofs that are typically done when you first encounter Boolean rings. So I suspect the test makers don't expect students to think up these proofs during the exam. They're kind of testing, have the students seen and remember them from their past. We know that one and three are true. So I guess we know the answer to the question because none of the options say that one, two, and three are all true. Two must be false. Just for the hell of it, I'll prove that two is false. I think the easiest way to prove that it's false is to consider the ring that contains the elements zero and one, where multiplication and addition are defined mod two. So zero plus zero is zero, zero plus one is one, one plus zero is one, and one plus one is zero. And when I'm multiplying, zero times anything is zero, and one times one is one. You can quickly check that it satisfies all these axioms. This is denoted as z mod two z, and is likely a ring you're familiar with. Anyways, what statement two says is that if I take any element from this ring and multiply it by itself enough times, I'll eventually get zero. Is that true? No, that's not true. Consider the element one. If you multiply one by itself one time, you get one, and maybe therefore by induction or something, one to any power is equal to one. Therefore, there does not exist an n such that one to the n power equals zero. Therefore, statement two is false. One and three are true. E is the answer to the question.